So um, it's my pleasure to welcome you today on behalf of H2O AI. Thank you very much for being here. Like I said, I know you've got a ton of things to do. We really appreciate your time and the fact that you're here. And I'm sure our speakers do too. Two of the most progressive physician leaders that I've had the pleasure of working with for quite some time. Uh, my name is Prashant Natarajan. I'm the Senior Director of AI Applications for Health, Life Sciences, and Government at H2O. My own background is <clears throat> in various aspects of health and life sciences for the last 20 odd years with various organizations, Sonar, Mekeson, Siemens, uh, Fresenius Dialysis, and then various commercial and government health plans and life sciences companies. Before I came to H2O recently, I'm a newbie here, about four weeks, extremely excited to be here. I used to lead product for Oracle Health Sciences for about 10 years, where I was responsible for building a multi $100 million portfolio um, using health and life sciences data. Um, I think one of the few successful efforts <clears throat> out there. Uh, it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce you first to my friend Babar Gauri here, and uh, he has traveled from Pennsylvania to be with us today. And <clears throat> I'm going to read out, because both of these gentlemen are so accomplished that I couldn't memorize. We need a deep learning system for that uh, the next time around, but right now we'll just keep to this. So <clears throat> Dr. Gauri is a board certified practicing uh, hospitalist physician serving St. Mary Medical Center as their CMIO, Chief Medical Information Officer, and also serves Trinity Health as the East Division CMIO. Trinity Health, for those of us who are not aware, is the largest uh, faith-based nonprofit health system in the country. So uh, his interests are in medical informatics, clinical documentation, medical education, patient safety, decision sciences, research, and technology. And uh, these diverse interests have been married in his roles as an informatic professionals and also as a regional leader in simulation medicine. He has a, a great passion for all activities. He's an entrepreneur um, and, and he's also one of the folks who is leading the conversations on integrated medicine and taking a look at medicine beyond what we accept as the obvious today and making the connections between things such as social determinants of health and various other factors that influence a person's health than just medicine as it is practiced currently. So we thought that given the other topic that we have, we're gonna have Dr. Mukherjee here talk about precision medicine, traumatic brain injury, and how we can essentially make deep learning better based on what we learn from the brain. So we thought, Given that topic, and then with Dr. Gauri providing uh, an overview of health system opportunities and challenges from an integrated SDOH perspective, we would have a full agenda today. So the way we are going to do this is Dr. Mukherjee is going to go first. He's going to talk about the pioneering work he has been doing at UCSF, among other places. And then we will have Dr. Gauri go next. And uh, we will finish that up with a panel where we'll also open the floor for audience questions. We like to make this as interactive as possible during that panel discussion time. So on, on that note, I also want to um, introduce Dr. Pratik Mukherjee, MD, PhD. He's a professor in, radi uh, professor in residence at the uh, Department of Radiology and Biomedical Imaging at UCSF. He's also an attending neuroradiologist there. He is also director of the Center for the Imaging of Neurodegenerative Disease and has done quite a bit of work across veterans' health, NFL players, and if you want to know what's common between them, well, just wait for his presentation. He's gonna talk about it. Um, um, I've had the pleasure of working as an industry advisor with Pratik for a few years now, and I think he's, his work is going to influence what we do in our field for many years to come. Um, he received his PhD in neuroscience from Rockefeller University in New York, his MD from Cornell, and completed his internship in internal medicine at Cornell, again, New York Hospital, followed by a residency in radiology and a fellowship in neuroradiology at Washington University Medical Center in St. Louis. His primary clinical research is the study of neurodevelopment disorders 
and traumatic brain injury using advanced MRI. You'll hear more about that today. He has served as a principal investigator or a co-principal for several NIH grants. His work has been funded by the Department of Defense, the McDonald Foundation, the Dana Foundation, GE Healthcare, and the GE NFL Head Health Initiative. He has published over 80 peer-reviewed papers. And I must have gotten all of your interests really peaked right now. So without much ado, Dr. Mukherjee. A big hand, please. Thank, thank you very much, Prashant, for that very kind introduction. And it's a great honor for me to be here to speak to all of you uh, on this occasion of uh, the uh, launch of AI in healthcare for H2O.AI. And I hope you'll find what I am going to discuss interesting. <clears throat> so it's clear, and you see in the news, that uh, artificial intelligence, especially these deep learning systems, uh, have a lot of potential for. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll have to uh, keep, yeah, keep, yeah. I'll try to stay on the left side here. So I'll be talking toward the end about practical applications of uh, this technology for uh, preventing delayed or misdiagnoses that could result in a patient's death or lifelong disability, and I'll also be talking about research applications of how to use AI to develop better imaging biomarkers to use in a precision medicine framework, and I'll have more to say about precision medicine soon. So uh, probably most of you here are now familiar with how uh, the deep learning convolutional neural networks work. Uh, there are arrays of units which are basically convolutional filters that are uh, linear in their operation, and then they have output nonlinearities, including pooling between layers and this rectified linear unit uh, that's often used, uh, ReLU unit, is the output nonlinearity in these CNNs. The interesting thing is that inspiration for a lot of this came from basic neuroscience. And uh, so H. Keffer Hartline uh, found, was a scientist who founded the lab in which I did my PhD at the Rockefeller University, and he went on to win the Nobel Prize for his work uh, describing how the retina works. And the retina he studied was actually in the compound eye of the horseshoe crab, which is an invertebrate. It's extremely different. Instead of having one lens, it has a thousand lenses. Uh, you know, the human eye only has one, of course. It, many principles of how it accomplishes vision are different from the optics standpoint. But it turns out that what he found was that these early uh, visual neurons in the retina were basically convolutional filters. And uh, once that had been solved, both for uh, these invertebrates and then in the mammalian brain later on, which studies in cats and macaque monkeys and so forth, uh, by the time I hit the lab for my PhD in the uh, 90s, uh, they had gone on to uh, work out the nonlinearities in the system. So, and you know, the popular models were these integrate and fire neurons, and essentially these were pooling from the layer below, and then something like a ReLU unit, like you see uh, diagrammed right there. Um, is the, what an uh, integrate and fire nonlinearity is. So these basic concepts from how human vision worked went on to inform our current um, convolutional neural network designs. But of course, we're not there in terms of understanding uh, human vision uh, just from CNNs. There's many points of difference as well. All of these convolutional neural networks that you see, the typical ones are all feed-forward networks in the brain, and this is a diagram of uh, all of the regions of the uh, visual brain in the macaque monkey that had been worked out uh, decades ago using invasive tracer studies. And uh, this is something you couldn't do in humans, or at least not live humans. As you can't do it in dead humans either because the dead human brain will not transport these tracers. Uh, so they'd worked out this complicated map, and you can see that all these areas have lots of connections, and some connect back to the areas that project to them. These are very recurrent networks. There's a huge number of regions. Each one of these regions contains billions of neurons, you know, so it's far more complex than these simple CNNs that we currently use uh, for computer vision. <clears throat> so it's, vision is not yet a solved problem, but uh, I think that these uh, artificial neural networks are providing a model for vision and also providing the computational tools we need to understand vision. 
So there's a huge amount of back and forth going on in that space between biological networks and artificial neural networks. And it's not just vision anymore. You may have seen this paper that just came out in Nature like a week ago uh, from the DeepMind group in London, uh, collaborating with University College London, where they showed that uh, if it's been well known for a few years now, and in fact, uh, uh, the Mosers, a husband and wife team of scientists, uh, won the Nobel Prize four years ago for discovering grid cells in the entorhinal cortex, which is in the medial temporal lobe of the brain. And this, these cells are like a GPS system for you when you do spatial navigation and try to find your way around. Um, <clears throat> and they are in these hexagonal arrays uh, like you see here. And what this paper shows is if you uh, train a neural network, in this case, uh, it's this uh, recurrent LSTM network. So this is a recurrent network, uh, very different in design than the feed-forward CNNs used for vision. Uh, <clears throat> you can create, uh, and you train it on maze navigation data as an artificial agent, uh, the organization of the activities of the units in this LSTM become organized much the same way they are in the entorhinal cortex of the human brain. Uh, so you have uh, things that respond with receptive fields, much like grid cells, providing the GPS information, and they also tend to be arranged in these hexagonal arrays. So it seems like there's something fundamental to the information processing that when you train it on a lot of data for a particular purpose, you get these uh, types of organization that mimic very closely uh, what you might find in the biology that's uh, within our own brains. <clears throat> so this is um, somewhat distant right now from my perspective as a clinical neuroradiologist trying to make diagnoses uh, on patients uh, using their CT and MRI scans. And what this iceberg is meant to denote is uh, the diseases that are above the waterline on the iceberg are the ones that where I can confidently make a diagnosis from looking at your CT or MRI scan. So for uh, diseases that leave big marks on the brain or even smaller marks on the brain like MS, yeah, we can see those on an MRI. You know, we can see often for epilepsy what the cause is on an MRI. If you have a brain tumor, we can find that. But the vast majority, you know, upwards of 90 to 95 percent of the morbidity and mortality, meaning the disability and deaths, due to neuro disorders are from the diseases that are below the waterline there. And uh, these are diseases where imaging cannot be routinely used to make a diagnosis. At least I'm talking about routine clinical CTs and MRI scans. Uh, and, you know, you can see that there are neurodevelopmental disorders like autism, ADHD and dyslexia would also fall into this category. There is uh, all sorts of psychiatric diseases. Imaging is uh, basically not helpful for the diagnosis of psychiatric illness at this point in time because there's not big lesions in the brain that you can see. Uh, and also the neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And these are actually extremely prevalent. And so one I will talk about is traumatic brain injury. You can see that this is partly above the waterline if you have a more severe TBI and you have hemorrhages in the brain or uh, other lesions you know, that are big due to the t TBI, then yeah, we can diagnose that. But more than 90% of all head injury is on the milder end of the spectrum, like concussions. And we can't see you know, that on a normal MRI uh, or a CT either. So if you have a concussion, you go to the emergency room, the uh, head CT is normal, and the emergency room doc tells you you'll be just fine. Well, uh, you may be, you may recover quickly, but uh, a lot of the time you won't be fine. You know, about anywhere from a fifth to even a third of these patients have long-lasting consequences from their concussions. So the reason we can't see these diseases right now on imaging is because the uh, underlying pathology is at the more microstructural level and functional level, which is not readily amenable to the routine imaging we do in the hospitals. <clears throat> so TBI exemplifies this also because uh, many, many different treatments have been tried for TBI, many, many drugs, uh, different kinds of surgery, uh, even cooling the person if it's a severe TBI uh, and they're in a coma to prevent brain damage. And none of these trials have worked out, 100% failure rate. And so part of the problem, in fact, I'd say the biggest problem, is that our methods for uh, getting information about your TBI are very crude. So typically, you would be assigned to this experimental treatment uh, in one of these uh, treatments 
arms based on whether you have a mild, moderate, or severe TBI. And that's based on a judgment that the emergency room doc makes in the emergency room just by looking at you for about two minutes and applying a standardized score about can you, uh, you know, uh, follow commands, can you move your eyes, you know, et cetera. You know, very basic crude stuff that, you know, doesn't really prognosticate very well how you will do ultimately, especially if you have a milder or more concussive head injury as opposed to a severe one. So we're doing a nationwide study in which we're collecting standardized data across many different centers in the United States that have to do, so when the patient arrives in the emergency room with a head injury, we uh, catalog the symptoms in a standardized way. Uh, we collect imaging, not just a head CT scan you get in the emergency department, but we do uh, two MRIs with the advanced imaging, like diffusion tensor imaging and functional MRI that I'll talk more about. Uh, both in the acute setting and later on, uh, six months later at the follow-up period. We collect a lot of objective clinical data. Uh, we get blood from the patient so we can do proteomic biomarkers and do genomics. And uh, so these are the 19 current enrollment sites around the United States. Essentially, um, most of the major academic medical centers with level one trauma centers uh, and is uh, run here from here in uh, UCSF. I run the uh, imaging core for this study, and we're up to, up to about 3,000 patients now enrolled. And so we're collecting all this clinical and imaging and biospecimen data, and we're curating all of it and aggregating it, and the plan is to publicly share it on the federal TBI database uh, <clears throat> at the end of the study. And this is actually part of a more global initiative that was, uh, so our U.S. Uh, nationwide study was done at the same time uh, as a pan-European study called Center TBI, which was funded by the European uh, Commission. And the plan originally was to combine all the data uh, in the International TBI Research Initiative, uh, but now we're running into problems, of course, with the new European uh, GDPR regulations, so uh, their data will not be able to leave the, their countries, and we'll have to figure out a way to do the analytics on both sides, uh, and then hopefully combine uh, some of the parameters uh, that we derive from all of this data. <clears throat> and so the imaging that we do uh, as part of this study allows us to uh, look at the brain's connectome or uh, the big pathways that connect different regions of the brain using a method called uh, diffusion tensor imaging and the tractography that's based on that. And this is part of what will hopefully allow us to start looking at these uh, more granular microstructural information about white matter. So we think that the underlying pathology in a head injury is that, so you get hit and you're, you have these uh, high forces, G-forces, uh, accelerating your brain, uh, linear acceleration, rotational acceleration, and the net effect of that is to tear, to shear some of these white matter connections in your brain. And the kind of problems you'll develop after your head injury is dependent on the nature of that, of that white matter damage. And so people often describe uh, problems uh, with uh, focusing, you know, attention problems. They describe problems with memory. They describe uh, that their thinking is not as fast anymore, so information processing speed. And they have uh, problems making important decisions as well. So all of these can be very disabling, especially if they last a long time, which they may, after a head injury. And so we can hopefully get granular data and better target treatments uh, based on much better information about what's actually going on in the brain. And so it's now possible using these methods to, uh, from the regular anatomic MRI, parcelate the cerebral cortex into many different regions that each have different functions. And then from the diffusion tensor imaging, we can do the tractography where we can trace the white matter fibers as they go from region to region. Uh, and then we can ex uh, express all that as these connection diagrams between different regions, which we call uh, macro-scale connectomes. And we can do that for individual patients, or we can, if we want to look at a group level, we can see what's in common uh, as a consensus between the different brains. And uh, there's a whole branch of mathematics, of course, called graph theory that uh, functions on analyzing networks. And uh, a lot of, there's a lot of been work been going on in the past 10 years. The field is now called connectomics, much like genomics or proteomics, to apply graph theory to these uh, connectomes that we can construct from MRI data now. 
but a couple of cautions about using graph theory uh, unadulterated uh, for these kinds of networks. One is the brain network in white matter is spatially embedded. It conforms to the anatomy there. It's not a topological extraction like the network of your friends, you know, who may be in many different places at different times. That's all topology. So the standard graph theory metrics are meant for purely topological information and don't capture the spatial embedding. Also, graph theory assumes that the different nodes in your network are fairly uh, homogeneous, uh, but we know that these different brain regions are very different in their functions, and that needs to be taken into account as well for some types of analysis, so uh, in terms of using standard graph theory metrics. Another thing I'll impress on you is the sheer amount of sheer computation uh, required to actually do this the best way possible that we currently know how. So in the brain, you know, with the brain 3D brain volumes, uh, we talk about voxels, which are 3D pixels. There's uh, more than 10 to the fifth of these in any one uh, brain MRI uh, diffusion uh, data set. Um, <clears throat> then for all of those voxels, for every voxel, to estimate the fiber orientations, we use a Bayesian algorithm, uh, basically Markov chain Monte Carlo, which requires many, generating many, many posterior distributions on you know, the voxels to estimate the fiber orientations at that voxel for the white matter. And then on top of that, we have to do the tractography through the white matter, and we densely seed, so we generate 5,000 tractography streamlines for every voxel. So now we're talking about 10 to the 6th to 10 to the 7th streamlines being propagated through the brain. And if that wasn't bad enough, then on top of all of that, as an outer loop, uh, the way we do it is we don't do the whole brain just as a single pass, but we do every source and target pair for this cortical uh, parcellation uh, separately. So if you have n parcels, that's order n squared complexity for this outer loop of the numbers of tractographies you have to do. So it becomes extremely computationally expensive. Uh, so we have a you know, large-scale computing cluster on the UCSF campus, which is the QB3 uh, cluster at the California Institute for Quantitative Biosciences. But even with all that horsepower, and I have several hundred dedicated CPU nodes on that uh, cluster, uh, this takes a day to process just a single brain. Because of this um, computational problem, uh, big data, uh, high-performance computing issue, so who has faster computers than we do? Well, the Department of Energy does at their national labs. And they become very interested in traumatic brain injury, especially as it applies to veterans. So they talk about the invisible wounds of war, which is exactly what we're trying to find uh, with these uh, connectomes. Uh, so they are helping us out. So this collaboration started just a couple of months ago uh, to make this connectome generation process something that's real time, so it could potentially be used clinically. And this can be a long, process, like, you know, when I started doing functional MRI as a trainee uh, about 20 years ago for clinical purposes on patients, uh, it would take a, a day on a silicon graphics workstation to do the functional MRI analysis uh, that, you know, was needed. But now I do the same thing on the scanner itself in real time. It literally, as I acquire the images, the statistical maps for the functional MRI activations come up right there on my MRI console in real time because of the orders of magnitude improvement. Uh, of computing in, that, in those 20 years. Um, so we're now trying to do the same thing for connectomes, and as a start, we're uh, using the national labs to do the speed up. So whereas I may have a couple of hundred CPU cores dedicated, they have uh, 10,000 at Lawrence Livermore on their parallel supercomputer that they can assign to this task. So that's a factor of 100 speed up right there. So what takes me a day takes them tens of minutes. And we're working on GPU versions of these uh, pipelines as well for a further speed up that should take us up to a thousand fold faster to make this uh, what we call a, a real time uh, connectome that we can start to apply on an individual patient basis uh, in time to actually help the patient. And then of course, once you have all this connectome data, you have to figure out ways, you know, in these thousands of patients you may have the data on to actually model it and extract what the relevant features are in a much lower dimensional space, which is something you all are experts at. Um, <clears throat> this is our first attempt at it, so uh, we actually found that the simplest model, the linear systems model applying spectral graph theory is actually uh, making some interesting progress. This, we published this just uh, this past year. 
And another group, uh, whenever you have a good idea, usually someone else in the world does too. So a group in Sydney, Australia, came up with the same thing as well. And so we were able to show that there are these fundamental patterns of information transfer uh, in the brain from, that you can model uh, using an eigen decomposition of the structural connectome. Uh, so they're essentially like, very much like harmonics of a time series that you would do by Fourier transform, except we're doing that as on the graph of the connectome instead of uh, as a time series. Uh, so it turns out that the most fundamental pattern of information transfer is between the left and right hemispheres, which we see in both papers. And the next most fundamental uh, pathway, uh, at least in our hands, is the up to down and anterior to posterior direction. Uh, for them, that's the third most fundamental uh, then there's medial to lateral, so these are the medial structural core of the connectome and then connecting out laterally. They see the same thing as their number two harmonic here. It's not hard to see why these are flipped relative to each other because the eigenvalues of these uh, eigenmodes are pretty similar, so they can flip depending on the characteristics of your data. And it turns out that uh, the structural connectome information and modeling information transfer this way explains in a very sparse way the functional networks that are known to already exist on the brain from the last uh, 15, 20 years of work in functional MRI. So I think even this linear systems analysis approach is a major breakthrough to understanding uh, the organization of the human brain and how function uh, is uh, derived from that organization. But I think there's a lot more we can do if we had more sophisticated methods for analyzing all of this very granular high dimensional data to extract what the interesting low-level features are that uh, won't come out of a simple linear systems approach. I'll say one limitation of this approach is that it probably will work well only for slow dynamics, which has time to equi equilibrate, uh, <clears throat> whereas with fast dynamics on the millisecond time scale, where you have to deal with the latencies of transfer and understand, and latencies for information transfer differ enormously in different parts of the brain because the brain is optimized in certain areas to do very fast transfer like in the visual system, but in other areas like for frontal lobe function, it is uh, much slower. So you need all that information which we don't have to inform that kind of analysis. And in terms of uh, the future for the treatment of uh, neurological and neurosurgical and psychiatric diseases, uh, what we want is not just the snapshots of the brain that we can get from imaging, but the connectome forms the centerpiece to understand what you may now be able to get from wearable devices. So you, uh, there's now a lot of companies making these wearable EEG devices that are wireless and that will just send info to your smartphone or your tablet or to other servers. Uh, EEG is a little limited, so there's now po more powerful tools like near-infrared, which can penetrate the skull. It's passively. You're not injecting near-infrared energy. You're just, uh, look, well, you're injecting some, but it's uh, uh, completely harmless and uh, read the signals that come back from the brain. <clears throat> and then uh, magnetoencephalography is the next frontier. They now just uh, a couple of months ago, Nature uh, described a wearable system. It's not yet portable, so you can't walk long distances with it, but the technology is improving. So soon we should have fairly granular functional data, you know, which can be a time series in naturalistic real-world environments to feed into our connectome models. And that can then inform efforts at intervention, which is on this side. So these are various ways of stimulating the brain uh, if uh, there's some pathologic condition that you want to treat. And so uh, the most common non-invasive way of stimulating the brain is transcranial magnetic stimulation, uh, which is this figure eight device that delivers uh, a magnetic pulse into a particular area of the brain. And it's selective enough that if you stimulate the right area, you can get you know, the opposite finger to move and any particular finger. So as you move it, you can go from the index finger you know, twitching to the next finger twitching of course, involuntarily, since you're stimulating the motor cortex, but that's the kind of precision that we can get uh, right through the skull non-invasively now. And this is being tried to treat all sorts of different neurologic and psychiatric diseases. And then, of course, there's the invasive surgical methods like deep brain stimulation that are finding a lot of uses. And scientists are working with uh, newer approaches that right now work in animals. Maybe eventually they'll be translated to humans that can selectively uh, stimulate only certain neurons that are targeted with genetic methods. And so from this recent art article about machine learning applications in neuroscience from the Journal of Neuroscience just published a couple of months ago, uh, what they really emphasize in this key figure is the need for explainable AI. So we don't want black boxes, which is what many of our uh, current convolutional neural networks are. 
um, to, uh, you know, to analyze our data we d because we don't know whether to trust the information coming out, especially if we're going to use it for life and death patient diagnoses, and if we want to learn more about the system we're studying so we can uh, go in the right directions to make further progress. So we want explainable AI that meets all of these um, important uh, properties. And it sounds like it's exactly what you're developing here. So maybe we can just stamp driverless AI on this slide and uh, move on. <clears throat> so I, I'll wind up by talking about a very practical application of AI technology in the neurological space, which we've been working on with generous funding from the California Institute for, to Advance Precision Medicine, which is funded by the uh, governor's office here in the state of California. Um, and uh, this brings together um, a lot of collaborators, uh, not just at UCSF, but our computer science collaborators at Berkeley, our collaborators at the San Francisco General Hospital, and so forth. And of course, this is an old name now. It's now the Berkeley AI uh, Research Lab, BEAR. And so we're looking at uh, automated detection of neurological emergencies on head CT scans done in the emergency room. Uh, so uh, that can be like, for example, acute bleeding. And certainly, uh, this is, these are the numbers on how common this is. And you can see it's an incredible, uh, you know, more than $100 billion cost to society every year. It's about 7% of total health spending, not to mention all the lives that are affected by stroke, traumatic brain injury, or uh, ruptured aneurysms in the, in the brain. And so we are looking to do automated detection of all of these uh, abnormalities. <clears throat> and for stroke especially, uh, detecting these faster is just as important as not missing them in the diagnosis. Because if you don't get your treatment uh, within the first hour, your intravenous uh, TPA to treat your stroke, um, you will be out of the window and not, able to, not be able to avail yourself of that uh, te you know, treatment that can save your life or prevent long-term disability. And, um, you know, medical error happens all the time. And, you know, in the hospitals, unfortunately, you don't have highly trained neuroradiologists all the time uh, reading these head CT scans, even in emergencies. Uh, most of them are radiologists that are not subspecialty trained in neuroradiology. On nights and weekends, they will probably be trainees, like our residents and fellows. Not that they're not good, but they're just not as experienced as the more um, uh, people with more years of experience. And it's been documented now in the emergency medicine literature that there are misses uh, on these scans. So we've created a, and trained a um, fully convolutional neural network that can uh, detect these hemorrhages uh, even when they're very subtle. So you probably can't see the hemorrhage on this scan because it's subtle, but there's this very thin ja uh, jagged line here which is the hemorrhage. It's right up against the skull. It's what's known as a subdural hemorrhage. Um, <clears throat> and it can be very difficult to see, and even a trained individual might miss it on a bad day. Um, and that could have very bad consequences long term. And this is our program. It can automatically find the midline of the brain, and it's detected and marked in red the area where the subdural hemorrhage is so that it uh, cannot be overlooked. And of course, these can now be flagged right away as soon as they're acquired on the scanner if you have, again, the right uh, computing pipeline that can deliver this information in real time, like I can get with my fMRIs now, uh, right to uh, the emergency department where this is being acquired. Here's an example where this is done um, post hoc, of course, uh, not in real time, because we haven't integrated this into our clinical workflows yet. But uh, here's the original head CT. Uh, it turned out that there was a very uh, subtle hemorrhage here that was uh, detected by our algorithm, but it was actually missed by both the trainee on call and the attending neuroradiologist. Uh, so this was not detected, but it was easily detected by our algorithm. Uh, and the patient wound up coming back later to the emergency department after the hemorrhage had gotten bigger, but fortunately it was uh, okay. And so some, this is some of our data. This is actually a little old now, and we're doing better than this now, but. Uh, so this is the typical, uh, what we in medicine would call the ROC curve, but which computer scientists call a precision recall curve, essentially the same thing, where recall is sensitivity. Um, and so for detecting hemorrhages uh, on our test data set, uh, we are now at an AUC of above 98%, or 0.98, which is approaching the blue dot, which is the trained radiologist on this task. These green dots are 
uh, non-expert humans uh, who have some familiarity with what these images look like but are not trained radiologists. And as you can see, they're uh, nowhere close in terms of uh, their accuracy levels. So we are approaching, we think, uh, human level performance, although there's still a lot of testing to do with this. There's always edge cases where the network may not have been well trained on, which uh, may have problems dealing with. But for the um, application of triaging these patients for earlier uh, diagnosis and preventing misses that might occur, we think this is already uh, practical. But uh, we need to also bring this into research and precision medicine. So precision medicine is, you know, developing objective quantitative biomarkers to replace our subjective and often unreliable clinical perceptions of disease. Um, but uh, imaging is lagging tremendously in this. Right now, there's actually only a single kind of imaging measurement that's accepted by the FDA as an actual biomarker. And that's actually measuring kidney volumes uh, to see if the patient has autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, which is, a, which is a genetic disorder. And that's it. Nothing else has been validated yet. So we need a lot more progress in this area. So that's an example of, uh, and the reason why it's validated is because the difference between the abnormal kidney and the normal kidney is absolutely huge. So you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to have much precision uh, to get this right. Uh, but for cases where precision is very important, uh, we need better, better methods. So we are working on this uh, deep learning technology to make actual precise volumetric measurements of things like hemorrhage and traumatic brain injury, aneurysm rupture, hemorrhagic stroke, and replace these much more imprecise clinical uh, assessments that are currently done. And then here's just some examples of another. This is a subarachnoid hemorrhage on the original scan. Uh, this is what the convolutional neural network detects, and this is the radiologist tracing. So you can see, uh, you know, the, that's the similarity there. And uh, we are getting uh, pretty good spatial correspondence on those. And also for other different kinds of hemorrhage, uh, you have in the middle the uh, convolutional neural network detection and then the uh, comparison to the radiologist tracing. So obviously, you know, uh, we can't have radiologists tracing these things on every uh, slice of all of these scans for uh, the hundreds of scans that come through every hospital. I mean, it's just completely not feasible by many orders of magnitude. But with these uh, CNNs that can spit out these results within, uh, if you have the right GPUs, a matter of minutes, um, uh, it's completely feasible. So we'll say that deep learning uh, has, uh, is now a powerful AI method for automated uh, detection and quantification for important features in images. And uh, we think these uh, features can be uh, biomarkers for precision medicine. And certainly a cloud-based AI would enable aggregation of the standardized quantitative biomarkers from imaging exams around the country like we're doing with our TRAC TBI uh, nationwide study. Uh, for use in clinical research. And then as we are planning to do at the end of the study, uh, we can standardize them and share them as a publicly available searchable resource. And of course, for the actual clinical application, you can imagine a cloud-based AI to which any of these medical images could be uploaded from anywhere in the world, be analyzed properly for clinical purposes, and then the results sent back immediately. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, that would be uh, available even in underserved communities, you know, since uh, thin clients are available for display of these images and uh, all the processing is done in the cloud. So I know that's a lot uh, to absorb in a short time. I hope I stayed on time and uh, I will turn it over to the next speaker and uh, I guess we'll have questions later. It or, will be me again. Oh, okay. No. Got it. But he deserves a hand for that.